this week. I've moved it further away. All right. Welcome to whatever the heck this is now. Lecture 7. I don't even know what week we are now. 9? 8 or 9? Anyways, it's Lecture 7. Um, today we're going to be covering joins, which is notoriously the hardest concept to understand in SQL. It's one of those concepts that you don't get until you get it, unfortunately. Um, and what I'm going to cover this week is inner joins. Notice I have the word inner in brackets uh, because, as I'll explain in a minute, you'll understand why I put it in brackets. Left and right joins, subqueries, and set operations, time permitting. Now, a join, just so I can explain what that is, is when you need to retrieve data from more than one table. Last week, all I did was retrieve data from one table. I worked with the data from that one table and only that one table. Sometimes you need to pull stuff up from more than one table. For example, you're trying to grab a, a, a value of a country when all you have is a country ID. The countries are in another table. You'd use a join to pull it out at the same time. Sometimes you need to pull up an order with their order lines. That also is when you'd use a join. Or pull a customer in their orders. Again, that would be a join. There is the most common type of join used is known as the inner join. Um, the keyword inner is optional. So if you just see me use the phrase join instead of inner join, it's the same thing. It basically returns records that match in both tables based on the criteria. There is two syntaxes. There's the old syntax. When you go Google online, you say how to do a join in SQL. You will regularly get the first one coming back. This is the old syntax. That's how I learned how to do joins in 95, which is before several of you in this room were born. So essentially, you select from and you list the tables comma separated, and then in the where clause, you tell it what the points of commonality are. Somewhere along the way, somebody said, this is really stupid to do it that way because there's big limitations. And unless you're running Oracle, you can get past these limitations. So they came with what they call a proper join syntax, also known as the ANSI join syntax or the ISO join syntax. And it goes from A, join B on, and then you list the points of commonality. And as I said before, the keyword inner is optional. Now, I'm actually going to do demos as I go with each of these things, just to make things a little easier to understand. So again, I'm working with ThinkCube. You guys have seen ThinkCube. If you don't know what ThinkCube is, go back to Lab 1, whoever it is that asked last week. That's so tight. So, select star from customers. We've experienced this already. That's not too complex. But let's say I want to go, as when you look at the customers, and you'll see that the state province ID is just a number because it's a reference table. If I were to go, I want to double check my table name before I continue. Yeah, it's state provinces. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tab this stuff a little bit so that it's easier to read. Okay. So I'm going to go... Actually, I'm just going to leave the star for now. And I'm going to hit run. Okay. So for everybody right now, you're going to see this says, oh, that looks exactly the same. Nothing's changed until I go to the end. And then you got ID and another name column. This ID name and country ID column is coming from the state's provinces table. So it's grabbing them twice. So let's say I want to make this a little easier to read. 
So I'm going to go in and type in just the word name. This is going to cause an error. It's an important error. This is an error you guys need to, to know. Column reference name, in quote marks, is ambiguous. How many of you don't know what the word ambiguous means? Okay, let's try that again. Who knows what the word ambiguous means? Hot damn, high school's failed me again. Ambiguous means it's not sure. It's undefined. Blurry. You got up after drinking for three days and everything feels a little ambiguous. As in, have you eaten in the last three days or not? Things are a little ambiguous right now. Ambiguous means the database server does not know what you're asking. So it's saying the name, the column name is used in more than one place. Which one do you want? So you should do like you should always do when you talk to people and be precise. Therefore, what I want is, and this is called a table prefix. You prefix the field name with the table name. So this would be, I want the customer's name. Now I can turn around and stick on And now we have, God, that pop-up's annoying. Now we have name and name twice. Now we don't know which one's the right name. Remember last week and I talked about al aliases? Dude, shh. If I do this, now we know which one it is. So last week I talked about aliases. I just aliased this column name. And we're going to leave the customer's name like this. Customer state provinces here. So here's what's happening. And I'm going to aim this a little bit at the screen. So the select part does it's nothing really new. You're just telling it what columns you want. From customers, that's also something that's not new because I did that lots last week. What is new for you guys, though, is the join statement right here. What that's saying is I want you to grab columns from customers and while you're at it, you're going to collect columns from state provinces also and you're going to join this table. So customers will be joined to state provinces and then the on clause here, you define the points of commonality as in what do these two tables have in common? And State provinces ID is a primary key for state provinces, right? State provinces dot ID is the primary key state provinces. And in customers, I've got a foreign key called state province ID. So state province ID, the values in here must exist in here. So when you do a join, it says it's going to grab everything from customers and everything from state provinces where these things match. So for every row of customers, it's going to find a matching record in state province and retrieve values for that match. Now, when you do an inner join, which this is what this is, it only return columns where the values match on both sides. So if you've got state provinces that aren't assigned to customers, those won't show. If you have customers that, have state that don't have a state province ID defined, they also will not show. They'll only show the ones that match up. Now, a question I get from students sometimes is, how many joins am I allowed to have? As many as you want is the answer. So let's say I want to go and and I can do this. Now I can throw on. Helps if you know how to spell. And I'm going to run this again. Blip. So now we have a person's name. We know what political division they're from and we know what country they're in. And that's a join. That's a straight up join. The only thing you really need to remember is there's one other thing you need to remember that's important about the joins. It starts from left to right. Now, in this case, for you guys, 
left to right means top to bottom. If I were to put it all on one long line, like somebody last week said, why don't you write it all on one long line? That's why you don't. <coughs> Imagine if that was all in one long line, you can't remember what you typed at the left, you'd be scrolling back and forth all the time. White space is important. Now, what that means is it's going to go from customers, it's going to join state provinces, and then it's going to join countries. I couldn't do, um, I couldn't put customers down here and countries up here and then join customers here. It has to be joined in the order. So in other words, whatever's down here cannot be joined to something that's later in the list. So it always goes from first, second, third. This one can join this one, that's fine. It doesn't have to go to state provinces. It can go right to customers. But if customers was lower in the list, then you wouldn't be able to join. It would bomb out. So essentially, when you think about left to right, because later on when I talk about left joins and right joins, it's whatever's to the left or to the right of the word join. So it goes from left to right. In other words, customers is left, to the right of customers is state, uh, state provinces, and further to the right is countries. So as if I were to write it all out on one long line, it'd be left to right. And essentially you cannot join, one table cannot join another table that is to its right. It can join a table that's to its left, but it can't join a table to its right, if that kind of makes sense. Uh, you'll, you'll get the error messages when you try. Um, Okay, so if you do it and you get in the wrong order, you'll get an error message that looks like this. Missing from clause. That means even though you have all the tables in your, your from area, because literally the joins and everything is also part of the from. It means if you hit this, but you say, well, I've got it because it's in one of my join clauses, that means you did it in the wrong order. You need to, to adjust the order of your joins. Half of learning to write SQL is understanding what the error messages mean. And now it's back. Uh, huh? Okay, now it's back. It runs what's highlighted. All right, so that is the basic join. It's the join that's, gonna, that's used 98% of the time, 99% of the time. Um, pretty much everything that has to do with database work is this kind of join. There is other joins, which I'll talk about in a minute. But essentially that's the major parts of what's involved in a join. Is you have to have the from, the first table that you're, that's included in the query. And any other tables you're joining have to come in afterwards. And they go from left to right and you have to join on the points of commonality. Now, some people will say, well, why can't I use the old syntax? as opposed to the new syntax. Once you start doing left joins and right joins, which I'm going to be discussing in a few moments, the old syntax doesn't allow for left joins and right joins. That's why. Like, unless you're running Oracle, then you have this weird asterisk thing where you're moving an asterisk somewhere along the where clause to tell it if it's a left join or a right join. And I don't remember what the syntax is for it off the top of my head. It's been 20 something years, but it is Terrible. Okay. Really? No, there it is. All right. Now, the next kind of join is known as an outer join. Also known as a left join or right join. You'll see it written as left join or left outer join or right outer join. There's no such thing as a right inner join, which is so pointless. Of why do you call them inner and outer if you're going to make these words optional? So you have left joins and right joins. Left joins and right joins do the exact same thing, more or less, except depending on which piece of data you're grabbing. Um, any data that is unmatched is returned as nulls, and I'll demonstrate that momentarily. Um, the order is important because you use the relative position of the tables in order to determine the left and the right join.
I don't want to lose my query. All right, so I've got products. I've got versions. And and I've got product versions. Yay. So essentially, a product version is made up of a product and a version. We, I got you guys to diagram that more or less in class already. And those of you that were lazy went and realized that ThinkCube diagram already had this in it and they just basically, you know, copy pasted out of the ThinkCube diagram. But that's a valid solution. Actually, we'll go the other way around. Make sure my query is right, and of course not. What's the first rule of developing good software? Write a little bit, then run it. Fix that, then add a little more, then run it. All right, so I've created my first true join. Now, if I do Left join. Now, actually, I don't remember how many rows were returned. 100 rows. Now I have 108 rows. Now some of you might be going, okay. If I were to scroll right to the end. Hello. There we go. So what's happening is I'm telling it, I want everything from products, left join product versions. This is where things get a little difficult for people to understand when the whole left join, right join thing happens. When you do a left join, it's saying, I want absolutely everything from products and any matches you have from product versions. That's what left join means. If you do not have a join, return null values in its place. And thus you can see I got a, a, a whole whack of nulls. Actually, eight rows, eight rows of nulls at the end. And that is a left join. It's not a mystery. It's just understanding what it's about to do. So if I take off the left join, just so I can bring it back the way it was, 100 rows returned. If I go right to the end, you'll see that there are no null columns. If I put the, null, the left join back in, I get 108 rows back. And I got a bunch of nulls down here. Now, the other thing you'll notice is it will return everything that has a match first and any nulls at the end. So that's a little quirk. All database servers pretty much do that, even MySQL, and it's kind of special as it is, but even MySQL is able to achieve that capability of giving you the nulls at the end. Now, the right join does the exact same thing, but the other way around. So. If I did select star from products and did a right join from product versions, it would return everything from product versions and nulls from products. So same behavior, it just flips back and forth. It's not that complex. Uh, pretty much any left join can be written as a right join by flipping the tables around. Now, here's a thought experiment. Let's just say I want to know only the products that don't have a match in product version. How would you go about it? Yeah, so, so I just want the products that n that never have a never have had a product version. Close. It's not equal because nothing can ever be equal to null, right? Yes, that's actually it. Sometimes it takes groups longer than this to figure that out. So if I want to go product 
versions dot id is null. And now I have my eight never before assigned products. So a lot of people say, well, what's the point of a left and a right join? They're, they're really good to find out a bunch of things. Um, you can use them to find out products that haven't sold recently. If I were to include like a where clause on this with a date range thing, in the last 30 days, have any of this, and then you'd have to do a bunch of joins going back up the tree, right? You'd go products, product versions, product order lines. But if you say, are there any order lines and give me any products that have not had a single order line in the last 30 days. You could write that query. Or you could say, uh, which products in the last six months have only sold a handful? Maybe we don't even need to keep selling this because it's not actually making us any money. We got packaging for it, we're paying for shipping for it, and it's not selling. Why bother sell it? Pull it. That's what you use these kinds of queries for, is to find that kind of stuff. They're really handy. It's not something you use on a regular basis. I might use them two, three times a year. But I'm so glad they exist, those two or three times a year. Alternatively, my option would be to actually run, um, write an application and insert scripting language here to retrieve records and loop through them until I find uh, unmatched records. That would suck. It'd be a challenge. So these left joins and right joins are significantly better. And if I were to write an application to do this search, I can guarantee it would not run in 104 milliseconds. It'd take, you know, a couple seconds to run. It's more efficient. Let the database do what it's good at. All right. So there's one more kind of join, which I don't even have a slide for, and it's known as a full join. It's also known as a Cartesian join. Do you guys remember Cartesian math operations from high school? Vaguely? When you're working with data sets? Maybe? It's vaguely? Okay. The very best example of a Cartesian operation, I'm actually going to do it on the board, is this. We have a deck of cards. Right? A deck of cards has values 1 to 10, jack, queen, king. Or I should say ace to 10, depending how you want to argue that first card. Right? Uh, they also have suites of, you have uh, clubs and spades, hearts. Diamonds, right? So, how many cards are there in a deck of cards? The answer is usually 52. How do you get 52? Because you take each of these cards and you do one of each of these. So what a Cartesian join does is it returns a match of every column, of every row to every other row. Therefore, It'll return that. Then it'll take the two and do that. And it re basically returns a matrix of all the combinations of all the values in between those tables. Now, all I'm working with is 1 to 10 plus 3, which is 13, and 4. That's 52, right? Now, if you had 100 and say 80 on this side, what you're going to have is 100 times 80, which is 800 rows return. The, to dem demonstrate you guys the impact of a Cartesian join, yeah. And that's not a left join. This is a Cartesian. It's a full join. Yeah, no, a left join. There's nothing. No, there's no point. It's a commonality. With a Cart with a Cartesian join, you can join two tables that have nothing in common, which I'm about to demonstrate. I'll do it with tables that have something in common, but I'll demonstrate what it looks like. 
Uh, the right join does the opposite of the left join. So a, a, f a regular inner join, all, both sides have to match. A left join gives you everything from the left and any matches from the right. If you do a right join, it gives you anything from the right with possible matches from the left. So I'm going to do a, a Cartesian join like this. Some of you will experience this because you're going to make this mistake. So how many products are there? 58. We already identified that there was 100 product versions. And I got a typo. Oh, come on. The heck? That's new. No. Never seen that error message before. I think my solo Postgres may have Cartesian joins turned off. <laughs> because they're dangerous. Oh, that's why they called it. Postgres calls it a cross join. So we had whatever number of products it was and 100 product versions. There is now, how many rows did that return? Because I didn't notice. 5,800 rows. So there was, so it basically has a match of every product and every product matching product version. So 5,800 rows returned for that join because it's literally matching everything to everything else. Is it useful? Only if you're trying to build a matrix. So either a data matrix, a pricing matrix. If you have a, one of those weird combinations of things where you can theoretically buy everything with every possible option, then that's what the matrix are for. Um, I've never actually used it. Just saying. So a full join is also known as a cross join, which is also known as a Cartesian join. And I forgot the Postgres called it a cross join. It's in MySQL, you just submit the word cross. Just go to join that and this is what happens. And I, unfortunately, I've been beating my head with MySQL a bit for the last couple of weeks. Okay. All right, this is where things get a little special. Subqueries. Subqueries are also known as embedded queries. They are a query within a query. They're really handy. Um, but it's also like putting a drywall in a drywall screw with a sledgehammer sometimes. There is a job that's better for it often. Um, for the longest time, we didn't have those in MySQL. MySQL didn't have these at all. And that's why everybody made fun of MySQL. Then MySQL got them and then they chose to ignore other functionality that was just as useful. So subqueries are embedded queries. They are run before the outer query. They can be used, they can be used anywhere in the field selection list or in the where clause or even as a table. And you put them in brackets. Now, if it's a subquery in the field selection list, it's often used to return a single value from a secondary table. So for example, when you are presetting some values and you don't want to hard code anything in your application, because what's the dumbest thing you can do? Is hard code anything. Because then you're working with something called magic numbers. And I don't know if your programming instructor is going to tell you about magic numbers and why you should never do it. I know most programming instructors at level one never talk about the, the horror that is magic numbers. Magic numbers are bad. It means that you're setting something to one. 
just one, or five, or 63, or 42, but you have no understanding why it's that value. Unless you put in this big novel in front of it in, in your comments explaining why is this 42? Oh, because I liked a certain book. Yeah. No, no, I know. And yes, but normally for that kind of stuff, you're going to use, I don't know what they're called in Java, but in other programming languages, call them, call them constants. And you'll have a header file. In C, for example, you have a header file where you can predefine all these values in a contained environment. And everywhere else, you refer to the name of the constant, not the number. So instead of in the, the application, 26 places have the value of 6, and you have no why, idea why it's 6. But on the other hand, it could be uh, a constant called max loop value. And therefore, you change it in the header, and then the entire application gets the new change. Those are magic numbers. There's still numbers being defined somewhere, but you don't use them everywhere else. With databases, magic numbers are when you assume that certain primary keys will exist. As in, let's say you have a, a table called status, and you have a status type called new, and you assume that new is always going to be one. And then the doorknob in shipping goes and accidentally disables new, and realize he made a mistake, so instead of re-enabling it, because he doesn't have permissions to re-enable something he deleted, he goes and creates a new version of new. Therefore, the next order that comes in that is supposed to be defaulting to one is now defaulting to not able to be added because it doesn't know the meaning of new anymore. On the other hand, if you did something like this, and I had no I have a typo, there should be another quote mark right here. If I go select ID from status where name's equal to new, so regardless of what the primary key, the actual real number is, as long as it can retrieve, retrieve the ID of a record that matches the word new, you'll always have a value. Even if you nuke it and you recreate it, the new rows are still going to have this new value. It's always going to be a valid value coming out because it's going to give you a value that exists in a table somewhere at that point in time. So that's, so what it does is it'll run the inner query completely, return the results to the outer query, and then the outer query executes. Rhea, you're being annoying. I called you out by name. <laughs> that's what you get when you finally remember your name, you get called out. Okay, item number two. Subquery in the where clause. This is the most common use for subqueries. That, let me rephrase that. This is the most common use for subqueries for people that like using a sledgehammer to put in drywall screws. It has its place in the world. And some people understand this better than joins because you can replace a lot of joins with this. The same structure. However, it's a little more expensive to run than a join. Why? Because it has to run two full sets of queries at a minimum. So if I go, it's most commonly used with the in clause because you're going to assume that more than one value is being returned. And if we remember, it, what does the in clause do? It accepts a list of possible values. So if I go select ID from product versions where active is equal to true, it's going to give me every product version that is currently active. It's going to build a list for me in memory. And then it's going to take this list, it's going to pass it to the outer query as part of this in. So it'll take this query, basically turn it into um, comma delimited value, and I'm really being simplistic here by saying that, but it basically turns it into a comma delimited va list in memory, and then passes it to the outer query, and the outer query operates against it. And it's like magic. Poof, it just happens. Yes? It depends on the database, depends on the program language. Uh, if you're working with Visual Studio, it returns, it returns as like something called a result set. It's a cursor-based pointer to the contents in the database. PHP returns it as not really an array. 
it returns it as a pointer to a memory object that you can pull arrays out of. I'm a PHP developer, so I can really answer that one technically if you want. Um, Python, same behavior. Um, in Java, I have no idea. I couldn't tell you. I think if I remember, it returns a, re a record object. And then a result set object, and you can retrieve a record object out of the result set. Maybe. It's been years and years and years since I had someone show that to me. So I might be remembering completely wrong, but that's roughly what it does. And then your language deals with the pointer. Okay. okay. So as I said, this runs the inner query, returns a common delimited list to the outer query, outer query operates on it. I'll demonstrate these in a few minutes. Actually, I'll demonstrate these two first because the next one's the one that blows everybody's mind. Actually, I'm going to grab, oh, come on. Really? I keep forgetting I can't copy paste from my slideshow. Okay, I'll start with this one. This should return absolutely everything. And as you can see, it took 385 milliseconds uh, because it returned 114,000 rows. Now, if I were to go, I'm taking a guess here for product ID five. I don't even know if I have one of five. There we go. 2,297 rows. So if I were to do this, it'll return two product versions that support product ID 5. So it'll take 127 and 188, basically turn it into a common delimited value, and then operate on it from the outer query. So let me just go grab those values again because I'm an idiot and I didn't bother remember. So this does the same thing as this. But if you notice, there's a speed difference between the two. If I do this, 147 milliseconds, 182, 172, 152, 98. And now it's going slow because my laptop's hard drive just went berserk. But as you can see, it's still slightly faster, theoretically. I don't know why it's so slow. Anyways, now it's trying to make a liar out of me. But anyways, believe me, the subquery usually is slower. I'm also operating on small data, so 114,000 rows is small. When you're talking millions of rows, it gets bigger and slower. Um, and just so I can do the argument of what I was talking about earlier, how this is the same as doing this. Same deal. So this brings me to the biggest point about SQL. There's usually more than one way to skin that cat. All three queries do the exact same thing. Except this one involves magic numbers. As in, you know that 127 and 188 match product five. And honestly, even this is bad, I should be doing another dive one more layer in to get that product version ID. But essentially, this one here involves more magic than this one, let's just say. And this is the same, but using a join as the first one. They achieve the same goal. They'll do roughly the same thing. Like I said, some people like using subqueries. And on this data set, it's not that bad. Um, 
I used to have a database of all the barcodes in the world with, with, uh, with products and corporations that own each of the barcodes. It was close to 22 million rows. That's when you'd notice the difference on this. It'd be painful. So that's is what this uh, basically put. This subquery does this. So it retrieves this, returns into these values, and then does the outer operation on it. Now, how many subqueries can you have? As many as you want. You can go in as deep as you want, layer after layer after layer. Is it a good idea to do that? Probably not. If you're going more than one subquery in and you're really doing something that is normal, as in you could achieve it with a join, use a join. It's going to be more understandable for people that come in later. And you're not going to build up that extra overhead of diving in. Okay, this is the, this is the kicker. Subquery is part of a table list. This is the one that people have a hard time grasping the worst. The other subqueries are like, yeah, I get this. It's like a function inside of a function. Woo. I can understand the math. Subquery is part of the table list. It's known as a derived table. That's what its official designation. Man, they're loud out in the hall, aren't they? <sighs> I'm trying to gather my patience before I go outside and say something rude. It's a derived table. In other words, what it does is it extracts the contents of your query, transforms it into an in-memory table. So this table never exists. It's not written hard anywhere. It exists only in memory for the lifetime of the query. So it literally builds a table of memory and then destroys it if you don't have a memory leak. It must have an alias. If you do not have an alias, it's going to tell you you must have an alias. And that's actually a really long example here. I'm actually going to go back to ThinkCube and actually give you guys a, a proper example of what this looks like. Actually, I'll do one better than this. Okay, so this is something I showed you guys last week, right? Which was an aggregate function. I just added everything up. Now, actually, I'm going to move it to this side. All right, so in here, I've got the total for every order. <coughs> so you know when you get a bill and it says, here's your subtotal? That's what this is doing. It's basically adding up every line item for every order, added up by order. So it's totaled up by order. And as you can see, the order numbers go up in order, and there's our magic numbers. Now, remember I said you can't do this? Let's say I want to know what the average order total is. So I, I got, you know... 40,000 orders. I want to know what the average total is for all the orders combined. So I add up all my orders and I want to know what the average is. And I do this and it goes, ha you suck. Right? Because aggregate functions cannot be nested. You're not allowed to nest aggregate functions. So at this point, you know, you're like, well, what can I do? 
Well, the first thing I'm going to do is stick on an alias so that my column has a nice name. All right. Now I'm going to run this. And it's going to look exactly the same. Nothing has changed visually. Concept-wise, much has changed. What it's doing now is I am running this query. It's taking the results of this, taking the results of it, of creating an in-memory table, a temporary table in memory, and it's going to call the table dtable. You can call this anything you want. On the outside, yeah, I'm about to go do that. So what's doing, eh? No, it's, a, it's not sketchy at all because it actually makes complete sense yeah. in a logical way. Yeah. Because you can't aggregate and aggregate because the aggregate is or it only happens once the query is completely done running. So you can't run yeah. the aggregate a second time. So what it's doing is you take the query that you want to aggregate and you run it and it basically makes a, mem a table in memory. Like this becomes a full-fledged table all its own, except it doesn't have a primary key. It doesn't have any indexes. It's going to be slow as molasses in January. It is going to be brutally slow. However, it allows you to do magic, all kinds of magic. Um, there are significant advantages to it. So now, if I want to go and do this, I'm going to go... All right, and here's my average order total with lots of decimal places, unrounded. Now, please note, I'm not operating on the extended price out here. I'm operating on the order total because when this gets run and turned into a table in memory, this column is alias as order total. So literally, this is now called order total as far as the database planner is concerned. So then you can run the average on that. You can do a sum. You can do all the math you'd ever want on it because it's now a real value. Because it's already been run. It's run to the outside. If I were to do... Now, this is a little diagram that you're actually able to run for all your queries. And you can see that it's doing a table scan of order lines. It's sorting it. It's doing the aggregate. It does what's called a gathered merge. It does another aggregate. So basically this gather merge is taking this and turning it into a temporary table in memory. It does another aggregate and then does the aggregate on the outside. For some unknown reason, it does the aggregate twice. But that's what it does. And actually, I can tell you what this aggregate here is. It's because it's literally adding up all the order totals and then it's, taking, it's dividing about the number of rows returned. Because that's how you do math. Right? All right. So that's a derived table. That's its biggest purpose in life. For You can also use it to transform non-similar tables so they look the same, where you can alias columns to match other tables' columns. All right, you can use it to transform data types to do joins. You can even join an order. Or a derived table, I mean. So if I did this, and now I go... Hope I got this right. 
because I don't know how to type. Okay. Seven rows returned. Now, this looks like a really big complicated query and it's not. It just looks complicated. Essentially what I'm, I just asked the database is, I want to know what the average order total is by country. So I can figure out which country people spend the most money in. And as you can see, you know, the numbers are all fairly close to each other. But you are able to do it. And here's what's happening inside this query. And this is basically an example of pretty much everything I've taught you guys in the last two days. Yeah, I'm going to copy paste it in a minute. Okay, so here's the first thing that's happening is it's going to do the it's going to create the derived table because it always does the brackets first. It takes this query, turns it into something called D table. Now, D table has an order ID. It takes that order ID and we're joining two orders. I've shown you guys how to do a join, so we're kind of joining two orders. Of course, if we get the country, we have to get the customers, so we get connect customers to orders, so we know what customer placed those orders. Then we're going to connect countries to customers because how else are you going to get the country the customer belongs in except by connecting that. And then we're just going to group by the country name because it's included up here. So what it's going to do is it's going to connect all this, find all the customers in the countries that belong to those orders. It's going to match them up to this and then just do the math on it at the end. Four hundred fifty milliseconds. How fast do you think it would take a Java application to do the same piece of math? Seconds. Hundred. It would have to loop through a hundred thousand rows, doing a, a sort count, a sort count sum, and then take those results, loop through every order, and then loop through every customer, and loop through every country, and then summarize it based on those criteria. It would, uh, I know in PHP this would take me about 300 lines to write. Uh, and it would not run in 450 milliseconds. Not even close. So this is the where SQL comes into its own. It's this, this kind of stuff, these kinds of analytics. Um, it's great for doing basic math. It'll figure out your basic totals. You can do your joins. You got an alias. You got aggregates in here. You got groupings, the whole shooting match. So now, just so I don't lose this, like that. Okay. What time is it? Eight. How many slides I have left? Oh, okay. Um, I don't teach this very much. Um, if you want a better explanation of what the correlated script queries are, the booklet, the PDF that belongs to Unit Seven. Lecture 7 has a complete explanation of what this is. A correlated subquery is where the subquery depends on a, something from the outside query. So imagine the inner query actually is magically able to reach outside of itself and say, hey, outside query, I need to have some information so I can run. Now, with the other subqueries so far, each nested subquery is run once. So it runs the inside one, then it runs the outside one. So it runs two queries. When you do a correlated subquery, it runs for every matching row. So if you have 100,000 rows, the subquery will be run 100,000 times. There is a place in the world for them. I don't use them very often because they're so expensive. If I'm dealing with 50 rows or 100 rows, correlated subqueries are easy to work with. You're dealing with hundreds of thousands or millions of rows, correlated subqueries are basically painful. You're better off using subqueries like true subqueries that are nested instead of correlated. Um, like I said, the booklet explains it in much detail. You just have to be aware that this phrase exists, that correlated subqueries exist. Okay, set operations is the last topic of the day. And actually I don't have my database set up to do the demo on it, um, which is fine because my demo was basically the answers to the end of lab eight. Lab nine. It was the end, the end of the answer of lab nine. Uh, so it's better off. But if you really want to know what they are, you can always go look at my YouTube channel because they were there <laughs> in other classes. Um, all right, set operations. Set operations means you're working on two different sets of values from two disparate sources of data. So a union 
gives you the distinct values from two different queries. So essentially, it's really hard to do with a Venn diagram because the union includes everything but without duplicates. So it'll give you all the unique values without duplicates. The intersect gives you distinct values that exist in both. And except and minus, because depending on which database server you're talking about, they use either the phrase except or minus, it gives you everything in query one minus any matches in query two. Um, I wonder if I do have a setup. Let me go look. I do have it. Okay. So, I know I've got 10,000 customers and change, right? 10,100 customers. And I've got a table called trade show leads. You guys, email from customers. There's 10,100 rows. I've got a table called trade show leads. Thirteen hundred rows and change, so thirteen twenty nine now, what often happens for big companies or even small companies is they have their list of customers, and you know depending on the size of the company, you know the list is fairly significant, and you also have they go off to trade shows, and when you go to a trade show, how many of you have been to like uh, a gaming trade show? Or, you know, an anime expo. Okay, that didn't surprise me. Um, you know, you go to a trade show and often you'll be giving a little badge, right? And you can swipe a badge or you tap a badge when you come in at each of the booths. Uh, so, you, when you go to those kinds of things, you'll tap a badge, show that you're interested in at, at their products, and they now will add you to a mailing list because, hey, you came to our booth. So, you will get a list from the trade show of the people that visited your booth. And it basically, when you tap it, you're agreeing to give your email address to, or your phone number, or whatever, to that company. So, hypothetically, I have a list of leads that was brought in from a trade show. And I want to send out three sets of mailers. And the first one would be, I want to know, I want to send out a mailer to all the customers that I already have in my system saying, thanks for coming to visit us at a trade show. Here, here's a coupon on the next upgrade. So, this one I have to be careful when I say this. This specific one isn't just the ones that came to the trade show. These are everybody that came to the trade show plus anybody, okay, so it's everybody that ever came to the trade show plus any new customers or existing customers we have. So, let's say we want to send out a mailer to anybody we know. Absolutely everybody we have an email for, which is the worst kind of mailer you can do as a company. And I'm not going to talk about any companies I currently work for that do this on a regular basis. But sending out a, li a mailer to absolutely everyone we have in our, in our database. You know, it's only, you know, 75,000 emails going out on a monthly basis. And this is what this is doing. So if I look at, this, at these sets of numbers, we have... The heck was that again? And we know originally my customer list is, right? But we also knew that there was 1390, 1329, right? So, third, holy crap. So we know we have 1329 leads, we have 
10, 100 customers. So what's this magic number? It's basically all of these plus any in here that isn't already in this list. So it's giving me the distinct count, the distinct emails that exist in both tables. So every email from here plus every email from here, but it only keeps the first copy of each one it finds. That's a useful one because you know one of the, other than emailing absolutely everybody in your database, what's this, the next worst cardinal sin? Emailing the same guy more than once. Do you ever get the same email from two, three times? And because the A, they screwed up their mailing list, or B, you subscribe with three different email addresses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a few different reasons this kind of stuff happens. But sometimes because their mailing list <laughs> hiccuped and it, they went out more than once. So this is give me everybody in trade show leads plus everybody in customers. So that's great. So now let's say I just want to know anybody who came to our trade show that exists as a customer, but I only want these guys. So that one's called intersect. All right, 459. Again, this number doesn't even work with any of these other numbers. Why? Because there's 459 customers that came to our trade show that were already existing customers. So it's everything that's in trade show leads that has a match in, in customers. So Anything in trade show leads that is already an existing record in our customers. And what does, how does it work? It works based on the email address, no other information. That's another useful one also. This is the one we're going to send out the 10% coupon saying, hey, thanks for coming to the trade show. We'll give you 10% off our, your next purchase off our e-store. And, and then you got the last one, accept. Eight hundred and seventy. Now, if I took the intersect plus the accept, I'd end up with thirteen twenty-nine. So this is going to say, "Give me everything from here except any you find in here." So it'll say, "These are all new email addresses we've never seen in our system before. Therefore, we may want to contact them and say, "Here's a thirty percent off coupon if you buy our software for the first time." There you go, you're a new customer, 30% off coupon. Congratulations, yes. Yes. And with MySQL, it's the only way to do it. MySQL does not support accept and it doesn't support intersect. You'd use an in or a not in subquery. You'd go select star from trade show leads where email not in, select the email from customers. However, there is some limitations to that. Let's just say you want to make sure uh, you want to work on more than one column. Because with the set operations, the way it works is it looks at every column being returned. So if you go ID comma email and ID comma email, that means it's going to compare both columns on every sets of rows. That means that if any case where the IDs don't line up with the email address, you'll get that as another value. So actually I'll demonstrate. So 870, right? Thirteen twenty nine. Because it's going to give me everything from here except where it matches down here. The problem is that the IDs in customers will never match the IDs up here. So the ID plus email for each customer will never match the ID and email in trade show leads. So it operates on the entire row. So for every time you add one more column, it adds more uniqueness to each query. That means your set operations are going to get less and less accurate. Set operations come into their own when you work with the bare minimum number of columns. And you can actually wrap that in a subquery if you wanted. That's entirely doable because it's just another query. But that's the three kinds of set operations. They're not hard. Uh, these are very similar to what's at the end of lab nine. Not quite. I've actually made a point of doing it not quite the same. Um, but that is essentially set operations. It's no harder than that. It's one query. 
it builds a set in memory. In other words, it builds a list in memory. It runs a second query and then does the operation. So if you took, um, oh man, what do they call that nowadays? They used to call it finite math when I was in school. Uh, maybe discrete math, where you learn about set operations, operating with matrices and set operations, yeah. Data management, okay. If you remember data management from high school, they keep changing the names of these things, right? So if you remember data management from high school, that's what this, the database server is doing. There's all this, this, and it's doing it for you. Okay, so here's what it's doing once this disappears. So it does the trade show leads, treats it as a subquery scan. It does the customers, also does a subquery scan. What it's doing is it's scanning the two sets and applying them to memory. And then what it does, it's grabbing each, it's grabbing this one, it's scanning it, it's grabbing the values from here and it's applying the differences to this. And then it appends the results and then does the accept. It's kind of cool the way it works. Um, the explain tool is really handy sometimes when you don't understand what the query is actually doing. Um, you could teach an entire course on this, on the explanations. Um, but yeah, that's basically set operations 101. It's not much more complicated than that. If you understand what they are, 